Uh, I'm glad to be able to uh, welcome you all to this very interesting looking uh, session that we're going to have tonight, uh, in which we are going to be addressed by Dr. Catherine Aaron Bella, who is a lecturer in Jewish history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and at Tel Aviv University, uh, which I joked with her just now. Does it mean she lives halfway down the freeway from Jerusalem uh, to uh, Tel Aviv? She says that would be convenient. But it wouldn't be as nice, I, I, th I don't think, as living in Jerusalem. Her, her main works include Jews on Trial, the Papal Inquisition in Medina, 1598 to 1638, published by Manchester University Press, uh, which was uh, based on her dissertation. And then another, the Roman Inquisition Center versus Perifer Perif Peripheries, published by Brill in uh, 2018, which she, she co-edited with Christopher Black. Then most recently, Christian Images and Their Jewish Desecrators, The History of an Allegation, 400 to 1700, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, and we shall hear something about that tonight. Her research topics include antisemitism, the Italian Inquisition, papal Jewish relations and Jewish social and cultural interactions with Christians in early modern Europe uh, until 2019. She was co-editor of H. Judaic. She is now a visiting scholar at the Stephen Roth Institute for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism and Racism at Tel Aviv University. Uh, it is going to be uh, an interesting talk. And so welcome to you, Catherine, and please proceed. Thank you so much for the introduction, John. And thank you so much, Thea, for um, arranging this. So I'm going to share my screen with you, if I may. Okay, so scholars in the past have discussed the charges of ritual murder, of blood libel, and of course of post-desecration leveled against the Jews from the Middle Ages to the present day. But there had not been until recently a wide ranging study of the charge that Jews habitually violated Christian images. Always loving the study of art history, but seeing myself as fundamentally, of course, as a Jewish historian, this allegation became a 10 year project for me, which culminated in the publication of my recent book, Christian Images and Their Jewish Desecrators The History of an Allegation. 400 to 1700 that just came out now um, in January, 2024. My research intended to trace the chronological and geographical development of what I found to be a well-integrated image desecration allegation against Jews in medieval Christendom. Christians believed that Jews attacked images as you see here, particularly of Christ and Mary. These ideas really sprang from moral tales that appeared in Christian literature and non-literary sources. And here you have an image at the top of, um, on the left of a Jew desecrating, sticking a knife, um, a, a long spear really, a sword into a crucifix. Tonight, I will be talking about the persisting tales, myths, and fantasies about Jews, which appeared in literature and manuscript art, and explore the factors that shaped and sharpened this enduring allegation. I'd like to start with some definitions and then move to the actual visual depictions of the allegation which usually appeared on the same page or adjacent to, as you can even see in this slide, the actual um, image of the tale. So definitions. What do I mean by desecration? I use the term desecration here to describe the offenses against Jews, sorry, uh, uh, the, the offenses against images attributed to Jews Desecration refers to any form of vandalism, be it hammering, flogging, 
scourging, soiling, piercing, hitting, hiding, lancing, as I say here, or stabbing a Christian image or object. And according to Christians, Jews carried out such attacks to show contempt for a Christian object, deprive it of its sacred qualities that the Jews believed the Christians had mistakenly attributed to it. Desecration was not blasphemy, a verbal attack, though of course it could be accompanied by blasphemous words. It was an action that the Jew did with his, with one, with his hands, feet, or even eyes to objects and not human beings. Christians understood desecration to be an intentional Jewish reaction, the inverted response to increasing Christian veneration. Now that means that veneration and violation became opposing actions. What the Christian venerates, the Jew is believed to violate. Of course, just to clarify, iconoclasm are actions which seek to destroy images entirely or mutilate them irreparably, as did Christians at the time of the iconoclastic controversy in Byzantium or some Italian philo Protestants at the time of the Reformation. So not all forms of desecration constitute iconoclasm, though iconoclasm is always a form of desecration. And as I will show you, when Jews are depicted as desecrating images, the message is that they show them profound disrespect and indecency, but they are not able to put them out of action. Fictional Jews do not have the power to destroy an image protected by the divine being that it depicts. Instead, the reaction of the image is either that it can be cleansed by the Christian, as you see in this image on the right, on the left hand side, the Jew is putting the image in the latrine. On the left hand side, the Christian has found it and by re dedicating himself to it. it the, the image itself reacts here. It's pouring, it's steeping oil from the image of Mary. And these images either seek oil or in some of them they actually bleed. So I will be looking at that as well. What about the word allegation in the title of my book? Why do I use the term allegation as opposed to accusation? As we all know, Allegation is an assertion made without proof that an individual or a group of people have done something illegal or morally wrong. It can be very vague, may be founded on prejudice, such as a belief system which associates types of subjects, that is Jews, with a tendency to commit certain offences. For an example, an allegation is when Pope Alexander IV pronounces in 1258 and here I'll just read in the red, the Jews, like in great enemies of the cross and the Christian faith, treat these pledges. And here we're talking about Christian objects and images they've taken um, in order to lend money to Christians with irreverence to the disgrace of the Christian religion. And they act so nefariously towards them as is shameful to speak and horrible to hear. And what is clear about an allegation is that it has the ability to travel and endure, especially if, they, if it is inspired by the needs of the varying societies that it serves. Now, of course, I don't not, do not need to tell such an educated crowd. An accusation, though, is a charge laid before a judicial court that a particular person has committed a crime based on evidence or the evidence that is brought forward to suggest that somebody has committed that. My monograph then amassed evidence from stories told by moralist writers, from scenes presented by artists, and from records of formal legal proceedings, usually compiled by clerks, by notaries and judges. Tonight though, I'm going to just concentrate on the tales. When a tale describes an act of desecration, or an image depicts one, the story or the image is being offered by its maker as evidence that these things have happened in the past 
and may induce the audience to believe that they will happen again in the future. Now, there are two different themes in the Christian allegation of Jews violating images that I've listed for you here. The first is the rather more plausible idea, and I'm just reading from the screen, that since Judaism is a religion without images and Christianity venerates images, Jews have to be tempted to attack any Christian image, especially if they are forced into unwelcome proximity to it. Now we have a second less plausible theme, which is the fantastical notion that Jews share the guilt of their ancestors for the murder of Jesus of Nazareth, and that they are therefore impelled to repeat this crime by violating images of Christ. And the implication here is not only that the Jews of ancient Judea put Christ to death, but also that their descendants wish to continue to show their disrespect by attacking things that portrayed um, or embodied him. The Jews' actions cause the picture or the statue to demonstrate on occasions its miraculous powers sometimes in such an awe-inspiring way that Jews could repent, convert, and be forgiven. And in this way, Christians achieve a great victory over its most obdurate enemies, because if the Jew does not repent in certain of these tales, he is usually put to death. And this is a depiction of the Jew put to death for committing image desecration. Often these tales and allegations and accusations were ideological and part, of course, of a larger effort to convince Christians of the sanctity of images and to further anti-Jewish myth-making in an increasingly intolerant medieval Europe. So why does Christianity devise this allegation and why does it last for so long? Well, my claim at its simplest is that the allegation reflects contradictions in Catholic European society, revealing an uneasy equilibrium be between their fear of idolatry and eagerness to encourage popular practices of veneration. Thus Jews and Christians accused each other of idolatry. Despite their different approaches to the veneration of images, Contrasting attitudes towards sacred images was a major source of tension between Jews and Christians. And here we have this famous um, um, stereotype of the Jews worshipping the golden calf in a stained glass window from the 15th century. In reality, <clears throat> Jews were critical of Christians for permitting sacred images and Christians critical of Jews for rejecting them. And Christianity continues to condemn this Jewish failing, casting biblical Jews as being idolatrous rather than making any reference to the Jews' biblical command to destroy idols. The persecution of Jews for image desecration was, one, was among one of several way, Christian ways of isolating and stigmatizing the Jews. And a current theme in Christian polemics against Jews was the argument that Jews were blind to the power and beauty of Christian images. Here we have the famous synagogue blinded by the snake that is wrapped around her head because of their theological blindness in rejecting Christianity. One more thing I want us to note before we start looking at the manuscript illustrations is the idea of the miraculous image in Christianity. Because both Western and Eastern European Christians began to legitimate miraculous images in the eighth century. And this is going to be important because they are often an integral part of these tales. So how did all this start? Well, in my mind, the starting point is actually the Inventio Crucis um, the discovery of the true cross legend. And here, of course, is a much later 16th de century depiction of this legend. In the 5th century, the Roman poet Paulinus of Nola and Tyrannius Rufinus wrote that Queen Helena, mother of Constantine the Great, the first Christian emperor, had come to Jerusalem, and I can say come because I'm sitting in Jerusalem, to look for Jesus's true cross. 
The legend told how Helena gathered together 3,000 Jews, despite the fact that in the mid fourth century, there was no such Jewish community in Jerusalem. And one particular Jew, Judas, who is singled out as knowing about the cross, but at first refuses to cooperate. When Judas is about to die of starvation, he prays to God in Hebrew to reveal the location of the true cross on Golgotha. The true cross is revealed, and through the revelation of the truth, Judas then converts to Christianity himself. In addition, the happy ending of the legend confirmed that the Jews' genuine conversion to Christianity was a consequence of the miracle that he himself had witnessed. The Latin version of this tale, of this legend, was known in Rome around 500 and made its way into European vernacular literature and the liturgies of both Greek and Latin churches. Of course, as you all know, actual fragments of the true cross, homilies, sermons, feast days, celebrating the legend's so-called discovery begins to be transmitted across Europe, confirming its popularity and disseminating its anti-Judaic focus. Now, this legend allows for two things that are going to be important for us. The first, as I write here, is the idea in Western's cultural memory that Jews and Judaism harbor keys to hidden truths, that they know something about an object that's important to Christianity that Christians don't necessarily know. Secondly, and more important for our perspective, is that it allows Christian authors to activate their own notions of Jewish abuse of sacred images. Remember that hiding, as the true cross was hidden, is a type of desecration because the Christians are prevented from venerating it. So now we come to stage two. The subject of the Jews' relationship with miraculous images and the trope of Jews as actual killers of the animated holy bodies rather than mere desecrators of sacred images would be introduced next. And this, perhaps not surprising to all of us, happens in Byzantium. Descriptions of historical Jews committing crimes against Christian sacred images begins to appear in Byzantine chronicles from the sixth century. During the reign of Constantine V, from 741 to 775, who is considered the most iconoclastic emperor of the eighth and ninth centuries. Iconophiles associate their iconoclastic opponent and their position on idolatry with Jews, typically denouncing them as blasphemers and destroyers of images. It was the first internal debate in Christianity where Jews represent the enemy for both sides, the iconophiles and the iconoclasts, concretizing the nature of a relationship between internal Christian developments regarding images and anti-Jewish accusations. If we look at this image, an image of Jews in a small Byzantine Psalter, a book of Psalms used by Christians as daily prayer books, which were produced in Constantinople. This Kludov Psalter was created sometime between 843 and the end of the ninth century and was intended for private study by the patriarch himself. Most of the polemical images in the Psalter, which were supposed to give context, clarity and relevance to the flowery poetry of the Psalms depict Jews. But their portrayal as iconoclasts reflect not only the iconophiles' own refutation of iconoclasts, but their own understanding of how closely the iconoclast argument had corresponded with the thoughts and actions of Jews. But the opposite is also true. 
because the iconoclasts argued that Jews were the same as iconophiles because they were idolaters who really worshipped the golden calf. And in this image, the Jews at the bottom are being portrayed as image desecrators. This Psalm 68, written, of course, in Greek, beseeches God to save the psalmist from those attacking him. On the right side of the text, the artist paints the passion. At the foot of the cross, the two to Jewish tormentors, identified by their Jewish garments, a barely visible knot of the hood on the left figure, and their facial figure features, a receding forehead on the left, combined with this elongated jaw on the right and nose to demonstrate their wickedness. They attack and torment Jesus on the cross. And it's interesting because these insulting and humiliating depictions of Jews are actually unusual in Byzantine art, which until this time depicted Jews with sort of undis with simple, undistorted accuracy. But below this, at the bottom of the picture, stand two other bestial men, almost together. So you think it's one, but there's another one behind them. The one in the front has been identified as rep representing the previous patriarch of Constantinople, John VII, the grammarian, the chief focus of iconophile Ire, who was whitewashing a medallion of Christ's portrait with a sponge dipped in lime. The two large and porous that you see here, as you can see here, at the, um, are there to collect the blood, connecting both scenes and showing that iconoclasts and fictitious Jews are identical in nature and behave in the same way towards images. Now, by the eighth century, iconoclastic as well as desecrating Jews had become useful villains in cautionary tales, both socially and theologically. The main message in these tales was that religious icons with their miraculous qualities were unquestionably to be understood as a fundamental component of Christian spirituality. The most prolific tale of Jews committing image desecration is a Byzantine tale called Christ of Beirut. The tale was recorded in the fourth session of the Seventh Ecumenical Council at Nicaea in 787, which discussed the legitimacy of the worship of icons on the basis of the Holy Scripture and the Church Fathers, as well as biblical and patristic texts. And the intention of this council was to reinstate icons in the Byzantine Empire. Now, this spurious Christ of Beirut was publicly read by the iconophile bishop, Peter of Nicodema, Nicomedia. Its concept activated the trope of Jews as actual killers of the animated holy bodies, rather than mere desecrators of sacred images, because, as I will show you, of its use of blood. Its story is set in fourth century Beirut, then under Byzantine rule, where the Jews were integrated into the social structures and spaces of the town. Peter recounted a story of a devout Christian who prayed in his bedroom to a picture of Christ. His dwelling was rather small and near the synagogue, so he decides to move to another part of town. In leaving his home, he forgot to take the portrait with him. The new owner, a Jew, standing here in the middle of the picture, is depicted as remaining oblivious or blind to the life-size Christian image hanging in his house. One evening, as you see, the Jew invited some of his Jewish friends to dinner. Unlike the host, this group of Jews observe the image of Christ. The Jewish council are informed and decide that the image has to be removed from the Jews' house. And the following morning, the rabbis and other Jews break into the Jews' home. Seeing the image, they begin collectively to reenact the crucifixion on the painting. Now, by the way, sometimes Christ of Beirut, Christ of Beirut is about a crucifix, 
Sometimes it's about an image, a, a two-dimensional painting of the crucifixion. These Jews collect together, they whip the icon, as you can see in these more modern depictions of the legend. And when they had pierced the side with a lance, they were shocked by this large volume of blood and water that seeps from the icon. And this gushing of both blood and water attests, of course, to the crucifixion story, according to the fourth canonical gospel of John, where a Roman soldier had pierced Jesus' side with a lance to check that he was dead. And from that place, there had been, quote, a sudden flow of blood and water, unquote. Then in the tale, the Jews wondering at this gushing and wanting to test the power of the image, decide to collect the liquids and test their potency on Jews who were, of course, afflicted with different ailments. And here is another element. Many of these Jews, sick, including the blind, the paralytic, are healed. And deceased Jews are brought back to life as a result of the miraculous power of this blood that you see collected in the ampulla in the middle. The Jews then approach the local bishop and ask him to baptize them all. And you see this in both of these paintings. So Christ of Beirut resulted in the miraculous blood confirming an authentic reaction of Christ through the painting and its waters as symbolizing the redemptive waters of baptism that brought about the conversion of the Jews. This bleeding of the image was a new feature of Eucharistic symbolism. The miraculous power of Christ's blood enables the establishment of belief for the Jewish onlookers. It confirms that Christ's Eucharistic blood could be connected to an icon of Christ and that the sacrificial death of Jesus could actually occur again in a passion painting. It was reported at the end of the tale that Bishop Peter had ordered a great quantity of glass containers to be filled with the holy substance of the miraculous blood and water, which were then dispatched through Asia, through Africa, and through Europe. And Christ of Beirut really morphs from a report at a council into a legend. An image supposedly appears in Beirut, which authenticates the tale with a relic. The image was reportedly brought to Byzantium and its passion relics receive official backing through the introduction of a new feast of Christ of Beirut, which is celebrated on November the 7th and the inclusion of special liturgies. What the legend also achieved was the initiation of the idea that Jews would use Christ's blood for their own miraculous purposes. This theme of blood, of course, is taken up in the High Middle Ages as part of both blood libel and host desecration. Just take a look at these late medieval images of the Christ of Beirut legend. The image around the letter S in this 12th century Passionale shows the Jew on the left striking his lance into Jesus' side and the Jew on the top right mocking Jesus by putting a sponge to his lips. And these Jews have been, and here, these, sorry, I'll just go back there. These Jews have been depicted with the invidious pointed hats, which distinguishes them from the three neophytes below who have been cured of their wickedness by the seeping Eucharistic blood. One of these converts who is collecting the blood from the image is about to pour it over the paralytic Jew who is lying on the bed below. Another convert has received the blood from Jesus's wounded feet into his blind eyes. Look, his eyes are filled with this blood and his upturned hands show his amazement that he can now see. Another image of the tale appears in the same 14th century French collection of legends mentioned earlier. Here, the scene on the left shows three Jews attacking a life-size crucifix, one sticking a lance into Christ's side, 
another collecting the blood, and a third raising a sponge to Jesus' face. In the second scene, one Jew is being baptized in a font by a haloed priest as another three look on. And the grotesque Jewish faces in the top corners are the same, in, you can see them here in the middle at the top, as these in this um, earlier image um, that I discussed as well. So now let us turn to medieval England and France. It is the monks of 12th and 13th century France and England who take these compelling Byzantine tales of Jewish desecration and elaborate them into Marian collections of exemplar tales, short didactic tales. These were disseminated, thus increasing their audience and furthering their polemical message. And at the same time, let's just think what's happening in um, Western Europe, medieval Western Europe at this time, Christianity is really sanctioning the use of opulent and grand sacred objects for pious devotion. And I want to show you two manuscript illustrations, two Marian tales, the Virgin image insulted and Toledo. We will look at these depictions in the Castilian Cantigas de Santa Maria, the Canticles of Holy Mary, that were produced for a royal patron by the court of the learned Alfonso X between 1260 and 1284, the year of the king's death. Exceptional for its age in terms of the richness of its illustrations, there are 427 narratives that contain not only the standard Western Marian tales, but a rich harvest as well of local stories. So firstly, the Virgin image insulted. Now one reads the visual images from top left across and then down, um, obviously uh, in a certain way. And I want to take you through each of these images individually. This is a tale of a Jew who steals the Virgin's image and puts it in the latrine, a medieval toilet. The Canticus's vivid detailed tales and illustrations confirm the ubiquitous intercessions by the 13th century of the Virgin, often as a savior in both spiritual and earthly concerns of the faithful. Note from all I've said so far and will continue to say, these tales are notably dominated by male Jews who are cast in the role of aggressive desecrators. Because I think that it was in reality Jewish males who handled Jewish ceremonial objects in the synagogue and Christian ceremonial objects as pawns. They were certainly more active outside the home than Jewish women. Now, Keep in the back of your mind that by this time, anti-Judaism is more aggressive. In this period, the fictitious Jewish desecrated, desecrator is depicted as governed by the letter of the law. He's blinded to New Testament revelation and is a perverse and dangerous threat to Christian order and Christ's body and blood. He is portrayed as holding Christ and Mary in malicious disrespect and his desecration of images exemplifying his blasphemy and treachery. So let's follow this Cantigas version. In the first image, as you can see, the Jew triumphantly holds up a painting of Mary and Jesus, which he steals from the portico on the outside of an unidentified building, probably a church, and his flamboyant gesture death demonstrates his temerity. He wears a Jew's discriminatory pointed hat, reflecting, of course, the standard Western European anti-Jewish topos that was developing at this time, and turns away from the image as he checks to ensure that no one is watching him. In the second image, a horned and rather comical looking devil approaches from behind the Jew as the Jew places the image in the latrine, suggesting that the devil is his overlord or partner and has in fact ordered him to put it there. 
Now, remember that by this time in Western medieval tales, devils are known to haunt latrines, providing this locus of damnation, which brought together the idea of moral and material impurity. Now, the caption on top of this image reads, here the Jew put the image of Holy Mary in the privy on the advice of the devil. And it should be noted that the initial act of desecration was actually carried out by the Jew before the devil's appearance in the second miniature, perhaps to show that the impulse to steal the image actually originated from the Jew himself. And in the literal descriptions of the tale, the Jew sits on the latrine and defecates on the image. This, by the way, causes his death as his intestines fall out. And obviously this could be a, re a reference to the story of Judas as according to the fourth gospel. This is not added in the uh, visual depiction in the Canticus, probably because such a representation of a, of a Jew sitting on a toilet would have been inappropriate for a book that deals with holy topics. So in the third image, the Jew is already dead. His eyes are closed, as you can see, caused by his own disgusting act of defecating on the image. And he's carried off on the back of the devil, trailed by a winged demon. In the fourth miniature, the painting has been removed by the Christian and his wife from the latrine. And the woman pours water over the image to clean it as it is held up by her husband. In the fifth, the Christian couple kneel before the painting, probably in some kind of tabernacle in a church, praying that the picture will regain its power after its unpleasant experience in the latrine. And it is at this moment that the painting begins to seep oil, confirming the veneration has won over desecration. The final miniature portrays Christian worshippers surrounding the image and an incense burner hanging in front of it, as the image now regains its distinct and brightly colored character in comparison to its blurred state in the previous miniature. Now see it in the 14th century miniature again from the French collection that I mentioned earlier. Here we just see this, this story in two paintings. In the first, the bearded Jew has removed the painting of the Virgin and Child and holding it upside down is about to place it in the latrine, but is restrained by Christian who chastises him. And in the second, as we know, this is when the Christian prays before it and is um, happy to see it um, miraculously seeping oil. So now let's turn to Toledo. In the Marian collections of the 12th and 13th centuries, in Toledo and Christ of Beirut, Jews are not accusing, are not accused of attacking Marian images, but crucifixes, and by desecrating them, are seen to carry out, of course, a reenaction of the passion. Toledo is a new tale that had appeared in Byzantine narratives, sorry, that had not appeared in Byzantine narratives and focused on the Jews crucifixion of a waxen image they had molded themselves in their synagogues and their subsequent massacre at the hands of Christian knights. So let me take you through this picture. It's a powerful and disturbing story without any literary precedent, describing how, on the Feast of the Assumption, the Archbishop of Toledo that you see here and his congregation are celebrating mass and heard the voice of the Virgin from the heavens crying out that the, that the Jews of the city were re-crucifying Christ. At the end of mass and after consultation with the Archbishop, on the left side, as you can see, the knights, of the city rush to the Jews' home and to the synagogue. Here they find the Jews reenacting the crucifixion on a waxen image in the center of Christ that they had molded by spitting on it, by slapping it, and even by one Jew placing a crown of thorns, as you can see on it. The Jews of Toledo were immediately killed by Christian soldiers. And so what we have here is really, I think, very fascinating because this idea of, of everything that's going on at the moment, that the Jews have been massacred during the First Crusade, there is a sort of a legitimization that is going on here that Christian soldiers need to kill the Jews. But one thing I really want you to notice 
is the type of killing that we have in this image. Because this sixth and final miniature portrays a particular type of killing not mentioned in any literary version of the tale. What you see here is that the, that the soldiers are attacking the eyes of all of the Jews. Look how all of the knives are actually piercing only through the eyes of the Jews as if what they're really attacking is the Jews failure to understand the importance of the Christian images. Now, if I had more time, I would tell you more. And I really sort of was wanted to really concentrate particularly on how how this is depicted in the visual um, uh, manuscript illustrations. This is something that obviously carries on into every society. And what I really try to show in my book is how it's always a question as to how Christians treat images in their society. And here we have a really fascinating depiction of a group of conversos in medieval Spain who are accused of desecrating images. And what I try to do in my book is really work out how it moves from being a very sort of anti judaic tale is onto the conversos. Is it you know through the eyes of the Inquisition? Is it because Spain at this time is dealing with a whole new um, emphasis on images? And some of the rulings on conversos is that they have to show their own uh, appreciation and veneration of images. So it's really interesting to consider how each um, different period of Jewish history uh, uh, so, and, and, you know, sort of Spain, uh, France, England, how all of these these countries refer specifically to the how the um, the um, allegation is treated. Many factors shaped the persistent Christian conviction that Jews were prone to desecrating Christian imagery. These, of course, include Christian doctrinal developments, Christian devotional developments, Jewish Christian polemics, Christian accusations that biblical Jews were idolatrous, and Jewish accusations that Christians were idolatrous. The circulation, as I've shown you, of various kinds of texts, actual Jewish and later converso behavior, and the viewing of images that depicted Jews as image desecrators as well. Now, I think that the balance between all these factors and how they related to each other proved to be different in each historical context. And I hope that I've been able to show you just a very small section of how it was depicted in these medieval tales. As I hope you've seen, it really clearly depended on the extent of image saturation in society. The political, social, and economic position of the Jews and the level of antagonism against them. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, it's horrifying for me as a Christian to uh, listen to and watch all that, um, but I have at the same time to be grateful to you for rubbing my nose in it. Um, there are lots of things I want to ask, but I'm going to. Uh, start just with one simple question before I then see who else wants to ask questions. The simple question is, how much of all those um, wonderful but horrifying um, uh, images uh, are present in the book? All of them. <laughs> wow, it's a fantastic book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's terrific that you were able to do that. Okay, right. I, I apologise that they're in black and white, but it was quite... In black uh, and white in the book? Do you, you mean? Well. Yes. Okay, right, yeah. So we so we all have to download into your course the um if we download the um recording of this, we'll see them in colour, will we, Thea? Yeah, right. So um that's another good reason why you've done this talk for us then. Is there uh, anybody who'd like to ask a question? Catherine, you have uh, presented us with an absorbing and horrifying and moving and uh, interesting and absorbing um presentation and we thank you very much uh Theo, is there anything else you need to say thank you very much no i just put in the chat the link to next event for everyone okay. so, right. thank you for coming then people see you next time okay.